Welcome, folks, to the 66th episode of the Lessons from the Cockpit podcast. I am your host, Mark Hacera, and for over 60 years, my passion has been everything aviation. For over 24 years, I was an Air Force pilot flying KC-135s all over the world, passing gas for a living. On the Lessons from the Cockpit show, we debrief some of the most intriguing and fascinating pilots, aircrew members, maintainers, and general aviationists from all over the world. Our purpose is to hear their stories, but more importantly, what did they learn from these extreme and extraordinary military, commercial, and even general aviation events and experiences? Analyzing these lessons learned, we get a better idea of how does the aviation world work? But more importantly, we increase critical thinking skills both in the air and on the ground. Many of these events and stories you hear on the Lessons from the Cockpit show for the very first time. This episode of the Lessons from the Cockpit show is brought to you by the book Tanker Pilot, Lessons from the Cockpit, found in all four formats on Amazon, hardback, softback, Kindle, and Audible. It gives you a behind the scenes look at air refueling operations all over the world and particularly in four wars, Desert Storm, Kosovo, Afghanistan, and Iraq. Pictures are included in the book and if you download Download the Kindle or Audible version. There's an extra file that has those 32 pictures in them, and those pictures are in color. My book, Tanker Pilot, is now included on the Air Mobility Commander's Reading List, General Mike Minahan's Reading List, which is really a great honor. I'm grateful for that. I mentioned behind the scenes look at four wars, and today we're going to analyze the shock and awe campaign, and I want to go through some of the limiting factors, some of the shortfalls that we had trying to review fuel these massive strike packages going into Iraq because we had a lot of issues that we didn't have in Desert Storm. So grab an adult beverage of your choice, sit down, strap in, and let's begin the Lessons from the Cockpit show and talk about air refueling shortfalls that happened during the shock and awe campaign because it was really a problem. There is an ulterior motive and a reason why I want to do this. At the end of the month, I will be speaking at Tail the Navy's big aviation symposium. I've been invited to be part of a panel that will be discussing the shock and awe campaign. It's been 20 years since shock and awe. Can you believe that? 2003, March and April of 2003. It's been 20 years since these massive strike packages, <laughs> airplanes coming over from the States, bombers, everything going into Baghdad for what we called ATOO was the real name, but the, the mainstream media called it shock and awe. The reason I want to do this is so that I can get all of the facts out as to why there were shortfalls. Because one of the emails that's been going back and forth in Tailhook mentioned specifically shortfalls. Fortunately, it also says they weren't my fault. And I want to give you some of the background as to why it was such a problem and a massive problem of being able to refuel and pass about 12 to 14 million pounds a day to all of these airplanes that were supporting the troops, both the Marines and the Army, as they made their march toward Baghdad. And remember, we were coming from the South and the North. The North was completely the Navy with some B-52s and other airplanes that were coming out of England. So this created a massive air refueling situation that we had not seen before. And here's the big reason. We had never gone through an exercise where we had to back the air tasking order into the gas. We always said there'll always be enough tankers, there'll always be enough gas. Well, the shock and awe campaign flipped that on its head because we didn't have the tankers that we had during Desert Storm. And I'm going to talk about that in just a moment. Here's the methodology I'm going to use. I'm going to look at shortfalls from the strategic level first and then at the operational level. But by strategic, I mean, what's the crew issues? What are the airspace issues, the political issues? Then I'm going to look at the operational issues where airspace and how the tanker plans went from planning to execution, all those different kinds of things. And particularly look and focus on our training at that time period and what the tanker force was trained to do at that time, because we had a singular focus at that time period, which was, of course, the single integrated operations plan or the nuclear war, which really needs to be discussed because that was 
also a problem. So I'm also going to do some comparisons with Desert Storm. I had all of the people working for me in the air fueling control team look at every chapter of the Gulf War Air Power Survey from the first Gulf War and read those chapters. We had to understand what we did during the first Gulf War so that we didn't make those mistakes in the second Gulf War. And that, I think, was a really critical key issue. And I printed off a bunch of those pages and started looking at stuff. And I thought, wow, I can't believe we pulled off some of the things we did in Desert Storm. But those same issues raised their ugly head again during the second Gulf War, during Operation Iraqi Freedom and Shock and Awe. We hadn't learned our lessons. They were lessons observed, not lessons learned at the strategic level and at the operational level. First strategic lesson learned. Obviously, when you're dealing with tankers, you have to deal in gas. And I'm talking huge, almost unimaginable amounts of fuel. We're not talking just a few million pounds. We're talking hundreds of millions of pounds. To give you an idea, Desert Storm, we transferred, I think it's 446 million pounds of fuel during the 41-day air campaign. During the shock and awe campaign, when you look at all of the airplanes coming into theater, as well as those in theater, like the F-15s and everything that we're fueling that are flying over Iraq, we did about 450 million pounds with a third as many tankers as we had during Desert Storm. Now, in order to be able to set up a effective and efficient air refueling system, you have to have airplanes that are close to a lot of gas. I'll give you a for instance. We had 20 KC-10s that were stationed at Al Dafra during the Shock and Awe campaign. The KC-10s are the one airplane everybody loves because it has both boom and droke. Most of the KC-10s that were stationed at Al Dafra during the war also had what was called the warp pods, the wingtip mounted air refueling pods, so they could do more than one airplane at a time. The problem was, those airplanes were using 1.8 million gallons of fuel a day. The KC-10s were taking off 320,000 pound fuel loads and they were flying 38 missions a day. The United Arab Emirates was only capable of refining 1.2 million gallons a day. We had our largest airplane with our largest offload capability located in a country that wasn't capable of producing the amount of fuel they were using in a single day. What I'm saying is we ran a Middle East Gulf Coast country out of gas. Let me say that again. We ran a Middle East Gulf Coast country out of gas. We had a very unique way of managing this problem. Colonel Jones, the 9th Air Force uh, logistics uh, colonel, the A-4, brought in a large super tanker into the port of Dubai and they were pumping gas literally from the tanker straight to Al Dafra to keep the fuel flowing to the KC-10s. That was the only way that we could keep Al Dafra and its 20 KC-10s going for 38 missions. Let that sink in for just a second. We ran a Middle Eastern country out of gas. And when Colonel Jones came to me and says, hey, you're not going to believe this, sluggo. The United Arab Emirates is only capable of producing 1.2 million gallons in the KC-10s. Just the KC-10s are using 1.8 million gallons a day. That didn't include the C-130s that were flying out of Aldafra, the U-2s that were flying out of Aldafra, and all of the airlift that was coming in and out of their C-17s and C-5s to keep all the beans, butter, and all the other things that we needed to keep the people going there too. That that large super tanker, I later found out, we almost drained it. Colonel Jones told me at the end of the war, we were within 16 days of emptying a very large super tanker of all of its fuel. 
fuel became an issue in the Middle East. Because again, when you have this type of system, air refueling system, we're flying average about 256 sorties a day. 38 of those were KC-10s out of Aldafra. You have to have a lot of gas. And when we considered what we called bed down locations, by bed down, I mean, where are we going to put the tankers? Fuel was always the first criteria we looked at. Does the place have enough fuel to keep the amount of airplanes that are there going to support the air refueling tankers, the KC-135s, the KC-10s, whatever it happened to be? Many of the bases that we were looking at for bed down did not have the amount of gas we needed in order to support the missions we were going to fly out of that base. And that automatically took them off of our list. The other issue that we had to look at is what we called ramp space. Do you have enough room for the tankers? And again, this is a strategic level lesson learned. The KC-10 requires 105,000 square feet for one airplane to park it because it's big. It's a it's a massive airplane. It's a it's a DC-10 airline. The KC-135, the 707, requires 65,000 square feet. In the Middle East, in Europe, where we also had tankers flying out of, and in the Mediterranean, that was another criteria that we had to look at. Matter of fact, it was the second criteria we look at. Fortunately, we had somebody on the team that had some mad skills with Excel and being able to put the formulas in the Excel cells and the spreadsheet. And we actually had a ramp space calculator that we could use to say, okay, we're going to put 12 KC-135s here. Will they fit? And we could drop that in the calculator for the particular airfield and it would tell us yes or no. It would tell us exactly how many we could put in there. And if you're only going to put six KC-135s or three KC-10s at a place, it's just not worth it. You want to be able to consolidate your tankers in as many places as you can. Now, during Desert Storm, fortunately, we had the advantage of having two really big places to bed down the KC-135s and the KC-10s. Now, remember, during the first Gulf War, KC-10s had been around since the 80s. They were fairly low time airframes. 135s, on the other hand, we had three different models. We had the A model, the water wagon, the E model with the TF-33 engines, and the R models were just showing up. A lot of the airplanes were just going through the R model modification with the new CFM-56 engines, which make gas. Uh, those engines are just fabulous. So we had a mix of three different kinds of 135s and KC-10s. Now, internationally, the French brought their KC-135 versions and the Brits had the L-1011s and the VC-10s were both there. So we had a number of airplanes and all of them, as you can imagine, the L-1011 is about the size of a KC-10, so it needs about 100,000 to 105,000 square feet. The VC-10 is about the same size, a little bit bigger than a KC-135. So it was still using about 65,000 square feet. But we had King Abdul Aziz International Airport and King Khalid International Airport. King Khalid International Airport is Riyadh and we had the whole south ramp. So there was, I think, about 36 tankers on that ramp. Jeddah, King Abdul Aziz, is massive because that's where all of the pilgrims come in, the Muslim pilgrims come in for the Hajj. This airfield is huge. The KC-135E models were all parked on a ramp. The KC-135A models were all parked on a ramp. The KC-10s were actually using the Hajj terminal and were parking there. On the opening night of Desert Storm, we had 89 tankers at King Abdul Aziz International Airport in the city of Jeddah. The reason we could do that was because it had its own refinery. When you go into the government books and look at Jeddah New or King Abdul Aziz Airport and under fuel availability, it says unlimited. It's unlimited because... <laughs> The airfield had its own refinery for gas and it could make, I think it was 2.5 million gallons a day. And 
we'll say uh, we're using Jet A, and I think the fuel density was like 6.5 pounds per gallon. So, I mean, you can do the math. That's a lot of gas. And that's why Jetta was such a great place to bed tankers down. Those 89 tankers were flying about 130 missions a day, if I remember right. So there was a runway event at Jeddah during Desert Storm every 30 seconds, night and day, 24-7, because that's how much gas it required. Now, here's another strategic lesson learned. From reading in the Gulf War Air Power Survey, we had about 312 tankers, Air Force tankers, that were available for Desert Storm. During the shock and awe campaign in theater, meaning in close proximity to Iraq, we had only 210 tankers available to us. So we had a third less tankers, but yet we offloaded more gas. All of the KC-135s were our models by 2003. And of course, the KC-10s. Our models burn about 10,000 pounds an hour. KC-10s burn about 20,000 pounds an hour. Still had VC-10s. They're pigs. They hold 165,000 pounds, but burn about 12 to 13,000 pounds an hour. Here's the difference, though. We were told specifically, Jetta is not available because of the Hajj. And as a matter of fact, I think General Mosley asked twice from Prince Khalid and Prince Khalid just flatly denied him any use of Jeddah International Airport or King Khalid. Both of those bases, plenty of room, plenty of gas, not available. So we ended up with the majority of tankers bed down during the shock and op campaign, 38 KC-135R models. I believe it was eight KC-10s No, 12 KC-10s, 8 VC-10s bed down at uh, Prince Sultan Air Base. And they had the ramp space, fortunately. It's a really big ramp. They've got a second runway there now, too, that we didn't have available during the shock and awe campaign. Again, runway saturation was also an issue because we had a runway event with fighters, tankers, ISR airplanes like the AWACS, RC-135, every 30 seconds, either a landing or a takeoff off of a single runway every 30 seconds out of Prince Sultan. Funny story about the fuel issue there. Prince Sultan had three 15 million gallon uh, fuel storage tanks that had not been used in, I don't know, over a decade. And we used Prince Sultan as kind of the lily pad for tankers. When the Turks kicked us out of Inserlik on March 17th, we had to send those tankers somewhere. We brought them to Prince Sultan. Those crews were already deployed. We had to get them out of there. Prince Sultan was the placeholder for tankers. Fortunately, Prince Sultan allowed that. He was the Secretary of Defense for uh, Saudi Arabia at the time and allowed us to do that. We ended up telling him a lot of these are going to stay there. And he didn't care. We told him we need more gas. We need to fill up these 15 million gallon fuel tanks. During that discussion, General Mosley found out when he asked this question of Prince Khalid, says, Prince Khalid, we're having an issue with fuel at Prince Sultan. We've got these three 15 million gallon fuel tanks that haven't been used in a while and we, we're going to have to use them and we're just running out of gas. Prince Khalid looked at him with a smile on his face and said, General Mosley, you are in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Gas will never be an issue. And I guess General Mosley says, okay, I I understand what you're saying, but I don't, don't know if I know what you mean. He found out 55 billion barrels, 42 gallon barrels of oil stored under the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. If I did the math right, that's about 12 trillion gallons of gas. Again, I'm using 6.5 pounds per gallon and there's 42 gallons to an oil barrel. So you do the math. In the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the fuel was not the issue. In the United Arab Emirates, it was the issue because they couldn't refine it as fast. In the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, they had numerous, numerous refineries and they could make Jet A for us anytime we needed it. So these 15 uh, million gallon 
fuel tanks. Of course, they haven't been used for so long. We don't know if they work. Some of our uh, civil engineers went out there and started cleaning them all out of sand and cobwebs and who knows what else. Made sure that the pump systems work and um, got them all cleaned out and certified, ready to go. One night I was driving into work. And I went by the main road that they use to get to those 15 million gallon fuel tanks, those three tanks. Those 284 fuel trucks stretched for four kilometers, which I think is 2.7 or 2.8 miles waiting to get on to fill up only one of them. We had to do that three times to get these things completely full. Well, the certification process took a little longer than we expected. And so that long line of fuel trucks was there, I think, for about 72 hours. As I was driving by and just taking all of this in, 284, 8,500 gallon fuel trucks, I noticed something. The truck drivers were, of course, being told they couldn't go on base, but they were told to stay there. Many of the truck drivers got out of their trucks and like spread their carpets out. They were cooking their food and making their chai tea right next to their trucks. And I got to the gate guard and I said, you had better go have somebody out there now. He goes, what are you talking about, sir? And I said, a lot of those truck drivers of those 284 trucks are all sitting waiting to get on base. They're cooking their lamb meat and boiling their chai next to their trucks with open fire little like hibachi grills. He took his binoculars and he looks out there and his jaw just drops. And he goes and gets on the phone to the law enforcement desk and says, you got to get somebody out there. These guys have got open flames next to their trucks. (laughs) And sure enough, somebody later did go out there and go, "Okay, you guys got to put out your fire. We'll bring you food. We'll bring you chai. But don't start those fires next to your trucks. Because can you imagine? one of those trucks and the fuel vapor going off with 284 of them in a 2.7, 2.8 mile long line and then just exploding one after the other. One of the crazy stories of uh, the shock and awe campaign. And of course, Colonel Jones went out there with his camera and took pictures and counted every truck. That's how I know it was 284 trucks. And I know it was four kilometers, 2.8 miles long because he measured it in his car, drove down from the first vehicle all the way to the to the last vehicle. A three days, 286, 8,500 gallon fuel trucks showed up at that gate to go on to continue filling up those 15 million gallon tanks. We had to do that every three days because of the amount of airplanes that were at Prince Sultan. When you talk about air campaigns, Helmuth von Molke's old adage, smart men study tactics, brilliant men study logistics, is so true because of the amount of gas that is required in order for you to support the amount of sorties we were flying. The very first chapter of Sun Tzu's book, The Art of War, says this. The art of war then is governed by five constant factors to be taken into account in one's deliberations when seeking to determine the conditions obtaining in the field. These are, one, the moral law, two, heaven, three, earth, four, the commander, five, method and discipline. The moral law causes the people to be in complete accord with their ruler so that they will follow him regardless of their lives, undismayed by any danger. Heaven signifies night and day, cold and heat, times and seasons. Earth comprises distance, great and small, danger and security, open ground and narrow passes, the chances of life and death. The commander stands for the virtues of wisdom, sincerely, benevolence, courage, and strictness. By method and discipline are to be understood the marshalling of the army in its proper subdivisions, the gradations of rank among the officers, the maintenance of roads by which supplies may be reach the army, and the control of the military expenditure. These five heads should be familiar to every general. He who knows them will be victorious. He who knows them not will fail. So let's talk about his second element, heaven. Again, signifies night and day, cold and heat, times and seasons. 
reasons. General Mosley came up to me one day and says, hey, Sluggo, I need you to make a slide. General Franks needs a slide to kind of show some of the issues that we have with air refueling. And I told him, I said, this will be easy to make. When do you need it? He says, can you give it to me by this afternoon? I said, sure, I can give it to you probably in about 10 minutes because I've already looked at this. And one of those things that I had been looking at for a while was the weather. My roommate during the shock and awe campaign was the ninth air force chief of weather he was a big guy a bodybuilder huge arms huge chest huge legs little itty bitty head like you see in all the muscle magazines his first name happened to be fred his call sign was fredhead which we all got a big laugh out of. I went to Fred Head and I said, okay, I need some help with this. I need to know what day do you think all of the bases from Baghdad South will be at 100 degrees sometime during the day, like around lunchtime? And he says, hey, I've got just the tool for that. Uh, Let me bring you an answer here in a few minutes. He came back about a half hour later and he told me, Sluggo, somewhere between the 5th and the 7th of April, all of the bases south of Baghdad will be at 100 degree temperatures somewhere around 10 o'clock in the morning. I said, perfect. And I think I gave this a name like thermal crossover or something like that on the slide. Between the 5th and 7th of April. Uh, At the bottom of the slide, I had time and on the other side, I think I had heat. And what I wanted to show was fuel available as one line and fuel required as the other line that they were going to cross somewhere between the 5th and 7th of April. What I mean by this, in the cooler temperatures, we would have more fuel available because the airplanes could take off with more gas. Once it was 100 degrees or more, that was going to be a descending line and the required line would start moving up. And that crossover, and the reason I call it thermal crossover, was those two lines were going to cross somewhere between the 5th and the 7th of April. It actually was on the 6th of April. Every base by 10 o'clock in the morning from Baghdad South were at 100 degrees or more during the day. Fuel required was going up because airplanes were having to download gas in order to be able to take off with the bomb loads that they were going to take off with, the B-1 in particular. And that was what I put a note because in thumb rate Oman, by the middle of March, it was already over 100 degrees. And so B-1s were having to download fuel in order to be able to take off with the 24 2,000 pound bombs they were taking off with. The other problem that we had was the KC-10s have a 50 degree centigrade wall. If I remember right, 50 degrees centigrade is 121 degrees. So as we moved in time farther to the right into April, May, June, and July, we were coming up to a point where the KC-10s were having to download gas in order to be able to take off. (laughs) And part of this was the heat and part of this was another reason. Apparently at the end of the runway at Aldafra, there's a very, very large tree that has been there. I don't know how long, forever. We nicknamed it the United Arab Emirates National Forest. It's only one tree, but that tree, we were not allowed to cut it down and it caused the KC-10 guys to have to consider it as an obstacle if they lost an engine. And that's what all of our takeoff data is based on, the loss of an engine. You're trying to manage the risk of losing an engine on takeoff by saying, okay, at, at a certain point, I'm if I lose an engine, I've either got to be able to take off or stop in the remaining runway distance. And if you're taking off, then that big, massive tree that was at the end of the runway became an obstacle that you had to go over. (laughs) And like I said, we nicknamed it the United Arab Emirates National Forest. It's one tree, one single tree. Somebody in the Emirates leadership would not let us take that thing down. So we had to put on the slide 50 degree centigrade wall for the KC-10 and the B-1s were downloading gas in order to take off with the maximum weapons load. They actually put that in General Frank's brief that he took to President Bush. 
And General Mosley came back and said, Sluggo, they spent almost five minutes on your slide, five or seven minutes, which in a presidential briefing is an eternity. You're usually looking at slides for maybe 20 seconds. And the discussion they had was, when do we start the war? And that one slide became very important because it said to them, in order for us to strike hard in Iraq, that means we've got to move the beginning of the air campaign back from that 5 to 7 April date is what I understand that was the conversation. Shock and awe, the opening was on Friday the 21st. It actually began on the 19th, which I think was Wednesday, because that was when the F-117s went in and, and that kind of began everything. This was the famous airstrike on Dora Farms where we thought Saddam and his sons were hanging out. Uh, it happened early in the morning of the 19th and two F-117s, Ram 11, Ram 12, with two EA-6Bs went in, dropped their bombs, and then I think we put like 36 Tomahawk land attack missiles on top of Dora Farms thinking that's where Saddam is. We might be able to end the war right here, right now by doing this airstrike. Here was another issue with the tankers. Not only did the KC-10s have this 50 degree centigrade wall, meaning they didn't have any takeoff or landing data available to them past that. They could not compute their takeoff data, in other words, their uh, refusal speeds, their rotation speeds, or their landing speeds after 50 degrees centigrade because it wasn't available. Boeing never did it. The other issue that we had was we were still flying in the guard and reserves, the E models with the TF-33 engines. Above 100 degrees, those engines were pigs. KC-135 E models had takeoff and landing performance above 100 degrees that just wasn't any good and we had to download gas in order for them to get off the ground which meant they didn't have much gas available i had this argument with omelet a guy that was on the initial cadre of the kc-135 weapons school who is now working at amc headquarters as his follow-on assignment after the weapons school he says you got to take the e-models you got to take the e-models i said omelet i can't bring them in theater above 100 degrees they don't have any offload capability, man. I, I can't bring them in the end. He says, you got to have them. You got to take them. The E-model tankers had JT-9D or TF-33 engines, commercial engines, and the engine performance above 100 degrees, they couldn't lift all of that weight off the ground. So what I did was, since these all were activated guard and reserve units, I put them like in the Mediterranean Ocean, lodges throughout Europe to support airplanes that were coming over but I was not going to bring them in theater because of the heat and the engine performance. It was hard for them to take off with any gas over 100 degrees. And then again, the KC-10 had that 50 degree centigrade wall. And yes, it did approach 121 degrees during the summer times in Aldafra. That's why Sun Tzu has those five constants, man. Moral law, heaven, earth, the commander and method and discipline. You have to look at those things. And as he says, you know, the general that knows these things will be victorious. The weather is always going to be an issue in the Middle East because of the heat. Now, at one particular base, it was the opposite. We had, I think it was six KC-10s from McGuire that deployed to Burgas, Bulgaria. Bulgaria had just become part of NATO and they really, really wanted to be a part of this fight. Will you please get us into this fight? So we put KC-10s at Burgas, Bulgaria. They only had ramp space for six and they could only fuel six. <laughs> but one of their planners called me one day and said, hey, Sluggo, all of our sorties are delayed today. You're not going to imagine why. And I go, okay. What's going on at Burgess that I need to know about? He says, it snowed this morning. I'm down in sunny, hot Saudi Arabia not thinking about snow, nor am I thinking about what effect that snow has on the KC-10 community. Here's why they were delayed. In order for the KC-10 to take off after it's been in a snowstorm, obviously you got to get all that snow and ice off the airplane, but you have to inspect the engines for ice. And in order to inspect the center engine, the number two engine that is on the tail, you have to have a high stand. Guess what Burgos Bulgaria did not have? One of those high stands where they could inspect that engine. Now, 
being great military people, they actually found a piece of old Warsaw packed Russian equipment that helped solve that problem. And they were able to inspect the engines. All the sorties were delayed a couple of hours. And see, that's a mistake I made. I'm in hot Saudi Arabia, not thinking about snow. We had one other weather phenomenon that grounded a lot of airplanes, and that was that massive windstorm, just like you see in The Mummy. We had one of those shamals. Fred Head came in, said, Sluggo, dig out your sand gear because we're about to get a royal butt whooping from the weather. One of those sandstorms is coming through, and it's going to rain mud that is going to be blowing at 75 to 85 miles an hour. It's gonna be like a thousand needles hitting your body. You gotta cover your whole body up. Again, these are things that I didn't plan on. Snow and the Shamal. The Shamal really had an impact through the entire AOR because it also affected the weapons. We couldn't use laser guided bombs because there was no visibility for the laser in this all that sand and that mud storm. Fortunately, For most of the tanker bases, the wind was blowing within 20 degrees of runway heading. And so most of the tanker sorties were able to get off. A lot of the strike sorties were not able to get off and we canceled a lot of tanker missions when that Shamal came through. A lesson learned, you have to look at the weather, but you also have to be very cognizant of the weather at all of the bases you have tankers at or airplanes at which was a huge thing for me, like I said. He called and he goes, hey, we had a snowstorm today. We have to inspect the engines and we don't have the high stands. And I went, what? Yeah, that's a KC-10-ism. We have to check the center engine for ice and snow. And because of the wind in the Shamal, it was blowing at 75 miles an hour with mud. The sand got on the water droplets and it turned to mud. And of course, the lasers and the targeting pods couldn't see it. And we had to upload GPS guided or the JDAM kits on all of the bombs. We ran out of the JDAM kits. We actually had to bring more joint direct attack munition satellite guidance systems over from the States because we ran out. Every airplane had to carry JDAMs and the only JDAMs the Air Force had at the time was the 2,000 pounders. The Navy had 1,000 pounders and 2,000 pounders, but the 500 pounders weren't in existence yet. So we were using up all of the JDAM kits that we had figured out we would need throughout the entire war and we're using them all in just a matter of a couple days. Because as my roommate said, Fred had Sluggo, get out your sand gear. It's going to be 75 mile an hour blowing sand and dust. It's going to turn to mud when it starts raining and it's going to be a mess. We won't be able to use laser guided weapons. By the way, the J-STARS moving target indication radar saw two of Saddam's Iraqi Republican Guard moving in the sandstorm thing and we couldn't see them. Blew them away with these JDAM weapons because yes, we could see them through the storm. Next issue we had at the strategic level was diplomatic clearances. Countries that would let us in, countries that wouldn't let us in, countries that kicked us out, like Turkey. We had to go through a very long diplomatic process in order to get the bed down that we were looking for. And it cost billions of dollars. An example, as I mentioned, the Turks did not want us to come back for Operation Iraqi Freedom. And the reason they didn't was because of what happened to them after Desert Storm. They lost a lot of money, billions of dollars, when they supported Operation Desert Storm. We loaded up Incirlik Air Base with fighters, tankers, ISR aircraft during the first Gulf War. And a lot of the countries around them didn't like it. Even though there are NATO partners, they didn't like it. The Turkish government was concerned in the second Gulf War that the same thing would happen. And their parliament acted accordingly. They voted against supporting the war and turned down the $2 billion we were going to give them for support for having us at Incirlik Air Base like we had been during Desert Storm. And I remember the night that the parliament was going to vote on us staying at Incirlik because we were flying Operation Northern Watch from Incirlik. And sure enough, the parliament said, no, we ain't doing this. The next morning, their stock market 
took a crash because they were expecting this $2 billion. Well, you're going to give it to us anyway. Well, no, you aren't going to let us in there. And on the 17th of March, every airplane that was on the ramp at Incirlik Air Base outside of Donna, Turkey, had to leave. And a lot of those fighters went home. The tankers stayed. We brought them down to the lily pad, the placeholder for tankers at Prince Sultan. Fortunately for me, one of the guys that was stuck up there was my good friend Shrek, Herb Clayton, Mr. Funny Man. And of course, he came down to Prince Sultan and I immediately told him, dude, you're a weapons school grad. You're coming with me. And he worked upstairs in plans and it was great having him up there. But there were other locations that just said, absolutely not. Will we allow you guys to operate from our bases here in the Middle East for this second Gulf War? In some cases, the diplomatic clearances came, but they came with restrictions. Here's an example. Cairo West Air Base was used during the first Gulf War. We had KC-135s there. It was not in really good shape in the first Gulf War. And apparently it got worse because when we got there for Operation Iraqi Freedom, we had a lot of work to do. The Egyptian government told us, okay, you can bring in 15 airplanes. Then it went down to five. Then it went to seven. And I think it went to 10. We only ended up, I think, getting seven airplanes in there. We could bring the seven tankers in there, but there was a cover story for them being there. That cover story was they were supporting training for the Egyptian Air Force. That meant they were boom only airplanes. We could only fly them boom only. And every day we had to have at least one of those tankers flying in support of the Egyptian Air Force getting refueling, recurrent training. And I think we had to fly one in the morning and one at night. So that kept those guys kind of busy. We could fly the other five or six sorties and support things that were going on for the North War from Cairo West. (laughs) But here's what happened. The base was in such disarray that we could only fly during the daytime for the first couple days. Here's why. All of the runway lights were either broken or gone. And we actually ended up towing the airplanes to the end of the runway with a tug. The crew would get in and then take off. And finally, they got some uh, Red Horse uh, airfield guys in there. And I didn't know this. They actually have temporary taxiway lighting and runway lighting. And they set that all up. You know, of course, the Egyptians are just sitting there laughing at us, you know. Well, we brought you into this base. We didn't tell you what kind of shape it was going to be in. And that was fine. We still were able to fly the sorties from it. (laughs) But for the first couple days, they literally had to tow the airplanes to the end of the runway, particularly in the afternoon. And I got to be honest with you, for the first couple days, I thought, God, this is dangerous operating out of there. And I told them, "Uh, let's not do it at night. Fortunately, the commander there was my wing commander, from Fairchild, a great American by the name of Randy Fullhart. Great, great American, great commander to work for. (laughs) Matter of fact, when I came home in December of 2002, I knew he was going to Cairo West. He didn't know yet. And so uh, I had a bunch of the documents for the war that I had brought home with me, including this great big, huge map of where everybody was going to be. And we got in his office with the vice wing commander and the ops group commander. And I said, so you want to know where you're going to (laughs) go? He says, you know where I'm going? I said, yeah, I do. You're going to Cairo West and uh, you may have a lot of work ahead of you because I don't know what shape that base is in. It's got fuel, but it may have very little else. And sure enough, I was right. You know, Colonel Fullhart got the right people in there and they got that place up and running with runway lights and taxiway lights. You have to understand all of these lights are different colors. Taxiway lights are blue and the runway lights are green. Of course, you know, the runway edge lightings are all white. And, and these guys did a great job of getting that thing all set up. But... Again, the diplomatic clearance said, you guys are here supporting the Egyptian Air Force and you have to fly at least one to two sorties a day for the Egyptian Air Force. They are boom only. So we couldn't have a drogue on the end of the airplane at all. We ended up supporting a lot of the AWACS and the RC-135s out of there, out of Cairo West, which worked out perfectly. But again, these are some of the issues that we had. Um... Went back and forth on the number of airplanes at different locations of how many we could put there and how many we couldn't. We ended up having to put tankers at uh, Al-Yadid. 
12 Grand Forks tankers went in there because we just ran out of space at Prince Sultan. And again, gas was another issue. We ended up with 210 tankers in theater, 10 British VC-10s and 200 KC-135s, KC-10s, all flying out of 15 different air bases spread out all over the Middle East. To give you the comparison, during Desert Storm, we had the 308 tankers, it wasn't 312, it was 308, flying from 21 different bases, five different nations, and 12 different aircraft, 12 different tanker aircraft flying during Desert Storm. And the reason I know this is because we had gone back and looked and read through everything we could find on air refueling in the Gulf War Air Power Survey from the first Gulf War. All of my guys, I made them read all of those chapters so that they understood this is what we're up against. Let's not reinvent the wheel here. Let's use some of the things we used from the first Gulf War. And diplomatic clearances was an issue. We had 15 bases for OIF where we had 21 for Desert Storm, but that included bases that were outside the AOR. We had 38 tankers at Akrotiri on the island of Cyprus. That came very late in the war. That came about the time we were getting ready to close Inserlik and Grand Forks and Fairchild had 38 tankers on the ramp there. Prime Minister Tony Blair gave us permission to put tankers in there, but that only happened like a week and a half before the war started. So at the strategic level, the State Department and our engagements guys, Otter was the engagements guy at the CAOC that worked all the diplomatic clearances. It was a huge headache, and that's why our plan changed so much. <laughs> Here's another funny story about this. We knew that all of the tankers were going to have to leave out of Inserlik. My strategy guy was a KC-10 guy by the name of Fred, call sign Sexy Fred. And he was really good at this strategy thing. And so we made a complete new bed down brief that we gave to the Dermob 4 and then finally to General Mosley. <laughs> And Sexy Fred called it roast beef, no turkey. <laughs> and of course, everybody got a big kick out of that. But whenever you go into a foreign area like the Middle East, or say the Pacific, if something happens in China. Diplomatic clearances is a painful thing that you have to go through in order to get your airplanes and your people into a particular nation. And for tankers, like I mentioned, first thing we looked at was gas. Second thing we looked at was ramp space. And once we got past those two hurdles, we went to Otter down in uh, engagements, engagements meaning the diplomatic clearance folks, and said, okay, we think this is a good place. You know, can we engage with with their uh, minister of interior or whatever and see if we can get tankers in there. And on a number of occasions, they came back and said, no, we're not being part of this uh, second Gulf War. We don't want it. That's why the chapter in my book is called Six Weeks in Hell. We had to reshuffle the entire tanker plan because the one that we came over with was unexecutable because we didn't have the bed down locations that we had during the first Gulf War. The two biggest bed down locations, as I mentioned, would have been Jeddah and Dahran because they never run out of gas. Both Jeddah and Dahran have their own refineries, never run out of gas, had plenty of ramp space for the airplanes, but Prince Khalid said, no, you can't have Jeddah, particularly during the Hajj. It was just a flat no. So when you see us moving troops and airplanes to some location, the chances are there was a lot of deals made to go in there to get diplomatic clearance. A lot of money was offered. <laughs> and I think we had a quote on the board. Somebody said during one of these tense diplomatic clearance meetings. This is like doing dope deals at the Mustang Ranch. <laughs> and it kind of was. You felt kind of dirty after you figured out what everybody wanted. And there were, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, even billions that were going back and forth for us to get uh, basing at some of these places. And then some of these bases needed a lot of work before we could put airplanes on that location. The KC-135 is considered a low density, high demand asset in the military. Low density, meaning we don't have enough of them. High demand, meaning you can't do anything without tankers. You can't move. 
You can't move troops. You can't move humanitarian supplies. Nothing goes without the tanker bridge being set up. By bridge, I mean tankers in locations all the way over to like, say, the Pacific that can refuel the airlifters or the fighters getting over there. In comparison, we had a diminished number of tankers from the first Gulf War. We had retired a lot of the old A models because they were wore out. The wing spars and everything, their airplanes were just wore out. We bought 732 KC-135s. During Operation Desert Storm, Strategic Air Command had in its inventory 694 tankers. There were 59 KC-10s and 635 KC-135s. All of these airplanes spread out amongst the active duty, the Air National Guard, and the reserve for the KC-10s. So there was a big pool during Desert Storm of tankers to choose from. In the first Gulf War, the 44% of the KC-135s and 81% of the KC-10s were deployed over to the Middle East or throughout the region supporting operations in the Gulf. During Operation Iraqi Freedom, I think we were down to 475 airplanes. I'm talking KC-135s here. We still had 59 KC-10s, so I'm just speaking to the KC-135 fleet. 300 of them were gone. We went from low density to a lower density in KC-135 airframes, which means we didn't have enough to do all the things we wanted to do. In the Gulf War Air Power Survey, particularly where the Navy was concerned, it said we had an unacceptable amount of tankers deployed to support 500 aircraft that were coming off of the carrier decks. During the second Gulf War, we had three carriers that were in the Northern Arabian Gulf and two carriers that were operating in the Med. That's a lot of airplanes, okay? Each one of them carrying, I think there's 85 aircraft to include helicopters on those carrier decks. When you have a low density aircraft like the tanker that are in such high demand, you have to husband them fairly closely. Well, during the second Gulf War, this became a problem because of the number of tankers we no longer had in the inventory. A lot of the A models had gone out to the desert boneyard at Davis Monthan. We had competing priorities for the tankers. By competing priorities, I mean big priorities. You would think that, okay, we're fighting this war, the war gets uh, all the tankers. No, they don't, because here's what happened. Remember, this is a post 9-11 world. And in post 9-11, there were plans on the shelf to defend the United States. Homeland defense. Homeland defense, I think, took 146 tankers to do that particular plan. As the terrorist threat level went up, more tankers were in demand to refuel the AWACS, the F-15s, the F-14s, 16s that were all defending the homeland. The airplanes at Kadena, 15 tankers. The airplanes at Mildenhall, 15 tankers were under operational control of two different commands. We couldn't use them. Now, the Mildenhall tankers ended up flying support missions for the B-52s that were coming out of Fairford. But we could not bring those into the AOR because they were supporting stuff for United States Air Force Europe. During the same time, Kim Jong-il, the father of the current guy, Kim Jong-un, said, hey, the Americans are kind of busy in Afghanistan and Iraq. Maybe it's a good time to get kind of frosty over here in North Korea. And they started launching ballistic missiles and showing some of the signs that they may come south. Pacific Air Forces implemented what was called Flexible Deterrent Option Bravo, which soaked up another 27 tankers. So now we're down to only a couple hundred. And I remember in, I think it was February, calling back to the Tanker Airlift Control Center to the folks that managed the tankers. One of the navigators that ran the apportionment of tankers throughout the world, Mac McDonald, said, Sluggo, I'm sending you the last two tankers Air Mobility Command has. I said, wait, what are, you, what are you talking about, Mac? He goes, literally, Sluggo, 
I am sending you the last two tankers AMC can cut loose for the war. Dude, it looks like you've only got this many KC-135s and this many KC-10s. And I went, what's going on? And he told me this whole story about Homeland Defense, Flexible Turn Option Bravo, and and the two commands that uh, had their own tankers. You always hear in the military, you go to war with the army you have, not the army you want. We wanted more tankers. We knew that we had to have close to the 300 tankers that the first Gulf War had, and we weren't going to get it. Matter of fact, we were going to be about 100 short, about a third short, and we had to deal with that. Problem that this created shortfall-wise was the opening night of the air campaign. Friday night, March 19th, was Air Tasking Order Oscar. Air tasking order. Let me explain that just real quick. It is what we send out to all the units that say, here is your timing. Here are your targets. Here's where you're going to be refueling, what airplanes you're going to refuel. So when I say ATO Oscar, and of course, Oscar and so on, that's what I mean by ATO. It is like sheet music to the planners that tells them exactly what they need to do, the timing, target, what package they're in, where they're going to refuel, all of those things that a unit needs to know in order to be able to plan and execute their mission. The air tasking order is exactly what the units use, the ATO, to build their schedules and what their airplanes and their unit are going to do. And in our planning cycle, we begin looking at Friday's plan on Tuesday night. On Tuesday night into Wednesday... Bart O'Dell, one of the guys that was working for me as one of the tanker master air attack planners, told me to fly the opening night, the dream master air attack plan, as we call it, the dream map. We were 42 tanker shorties short. We couldn't fly the opening night shock and awe where we were really going to punch them in the face. We whittled it down and whittled it down over a couple days, and I think we flew at 17 short. And as I mentioned, we had never flown in an exercise where we had to back the air tasking order into the gas, which means a lot of lower priority sorties, such as the leaflet drops and some of the electronic combat stuff, they didn't fly because they didn't have the gas. The other issue that we had was we had no spare airplanes, nor did we have any airborne reliability airplanes. During the first Gulf War, we would put KC-10s in very strategic locations in the airspace so that if a tanker wasn't able to take off, was broke, or there was some major change in the air order of battle in the air war, they could go to a KC-10 and fill up. It didn't matter if it was boom or drogue. They could go to the KC-10 and get gas. We couldn't afford to have spare airplanes if one broke on the ground, nor could we afford to have reliability airplanes in the air because we didn't have the tails to do it. Just to explain spares, those are airplanes on the ground that are in reserve in case something happens and an airplane breaks. Reliability tankers are the airborne gas station. They're just hanging out, waiting for changes in the air tasking order or the battlefield conditions so that there is gas available from these reliability tankers just hanging out in the air. So when they struck Dora Farms with the F-117s and the EA-6Bs that were supporting them, we had to drop strike sorties out because there was no gas. We had to take their gas of the sorties we sent home and use those to fill up the two F-117s and the three AA-6Bs that were supporting the Dora Farm strike. We did not have a reliability KC-10 for them to go get gas off of. That was just an, like a gas station parked in the sky like we did during Desert Storm, particularly during Allied Force. Nor did we have spare airplanes that we could launch with them and refuel them on the way. We had to fly every tanker to support the air tasking order and even then we only had a finite number of tankers that would only give a finite amount of offload. I think if I remember right the opening night of Iraqi Freedom, the opening night of Shock and Awe, the big Baghdad bash, 
I think we offloaded, I think it was 9.6 million pounds. And through the first portion of the war, we were about 11 and a half million pounds to 12 million pounds a day. There was no air to air war. Saddam kept his air force on the ground. We needed that gas. So we actually sent all of the air to air F 15s, that was the 58th from Eglin and the 67th from Kadena. We sent them home. We said, we need the gas. And if Saddam's not going to fly his air force, we don't need air superiority airplanes. So we sent them home and we used that gas to support all of the other strike sorties. Because many of these strike sorties, the F 15Es, the F 16s, they're all carrying air to air weapons and they kind of dual rolled the airplanes. If anything took off from the Iraqi Air Force, we had airplanes in theater that could shoot them down. And if Saddam, I think he only, I think only eight fighters flew during the war, and that was just a reshuffle from base to base. And they never got an opportunity to even fire on one of them. If you go back and you look at the Gulf War Air Power Survey, during the first Gulf War, the F-15Cs and the F-14s were sucking down the most gas doing these defensive counter air and offensive counter air missions. I think the F-14s were got like 33 million pounds just for the F-14s to do their air to air stuff. And I think the F-15C models, the light grays took on, I think it was 41 million pounds just to do DCA and OCA missions. I mean, that's a lot of gas. So that freed up extra tanker sorties to support the strike sorties. And of course you can imagine the F-15 C model guys, the light gray guys and gals weren't real happy about that. Their war was very boring, but we we needed the gas to go somewhere else. And if there's no air to air fight, then why keep those airplanes in theater that are using the most amount of gas because they're just sitting there droning when we can give that to strike sorties. Okay, one last thing at the strategic level and then I'm gonna move on to the operational level. Air crews. We learned from the Gulf War Air Power Survey that the KC-135 community only had 1.26 air crews per KC-135, meaning there wasn't enough to fly like two sorties. The Air Force KC-135 community in 1990-1991 was strictly focused on the single integrated operations plan, the nuclear war. Even though we were taking sorties off of alert, because remember, Pease Air Force Base closed and all the FB-111 sorties went away because Congress is saying we have to have a peace dividend. I still don't know what that means. The PSYOP, as we called it, only required a 1.25, 1.26 cruise per aircraft. The KC-10, because they have reserve pilots that also fly it, active duty was two, 1.5 for the reserves. So they're actually at 3.5 air crew manning so they could fly more sorties. This restricted us flying more KC-135 sorties because from Desert Storm to Operation Iraqi Freedom, the KC-135 air crew to airplane ratio did not go up. It went from 1.26 in the PSYOP to about 1.46, I believe is what it was as we were coming into 2003. What that means is you only have 1.46 air crews per airplane that restricts the number of sorties you can fly. What that affects also is flying hours. The United States Air Force tanker community had a restriction that you could only fly 150 hours in 30 days or 330 hours in 90 days. And that was wavered up from 125 in 30 days. We never got permission to fly over the 330 and 90. They would never let us do that. And they didn't during the first Gulf War either. They waived it from 125 to 150, but they said, we will not go over 330 hours in 90 days. We still flew the crews almost into the ground. We tracked the flying hours very closely. And every KC-135 unit that was operating in Operation Iraqi Freedom was flying above the 150-330 line. Crews at Prince Sultan were flying two sorties a day. Two sorties a day. 
Five and a half hour sortie duration was pretty much the average. They would fly a five and a half hour mission, come down, plan their next mission over about two and a half hours, and then go out and fly again. So all of the KC-135 units throughout the Middle East and Europe were flying above the 125-330 line. Fortunately, the war only went for 26 days. And on the 28th day, we actually started sending crews home. If the war had gone on longer than 30 days, about a third of the crews, maybe even a half, would have had to sit down and not fly for a day because of the 150 in 30, 330 in 90 day flight restriction. We knew that going into this. Because, again, we had read the Gulf War Air Power Survey, and I remember telling General Mosley, Sir, every stinking unit is flying above the 150-330 line. And he told me, Sluggo, the war's not going to go beyond 30 days. We're already knocking on Baghdad's door. I don't think we're going to have to worry about it. And he was right. You know, on the 28th day, I think, is when everything capitulated and uh, Saddam you know, melted into the desert somewhere and the Operation Iraqi Freedom shock and awe campaign came to an end. But this air crew thing was a problem. So here's how we fixed it. We had a lot of air crews in the guard and reserve back home that had been activated, but we had no room for the airplanes, both on the ramp and in the air. The airspace was saturated. I'm going to talk about that in the operational lessons learned. What I told Air Mobility Command, I said, leave the airplanes at home, send me the air crews. Now, this had never been done before. At that time period, we had active duty crews flying active duty airplanes, Air National Guard and Reserve flying Air National Guard and Reserve airplanes, and they didn't mix. I had to write a letter to Air Mobility Command to get that reversed, to say, Please allow the Air National Guard and the reserve crews to fly the active duty airplanes and vice versa. Here's the problem we have. We have to have at least a 2.0 manning in order to be able to fly the number of sorties we have to fly. That went all the way up the Air Mobility Command chain and they approved it. They said, yeah, okay. Now, the airplanes had different model numbers. I think we're flying Block 30s and the Air National Guard and the Reserve was flying, I think they were called Block 35s. They were virtually identical airplanes. The cockpits were virtually identical. And getting that letter signed allowed me to bring more crews in so that I could solve this 1.46 crew ratio to airplane problem and it worked perfectly. And as crews began flowing into Prince Sultan and other bases, it relieved some of this pressure where all of the bases were flying above the line. And matter of fact, you could tell when the Air National Guard and Reserve crews showed up at the bases because the flying hour line started dipping down below the 125-330 line. But again, this had never been done before. We had always separated the Air National Guard, the Reserve, and the active duty air crews, even though they were flying virtually the same airplane. And this is how we solved that problem. And we were able to fly more sorties because of that, because we were able to get the crew to airplane ratio up to 2.0. The KC-10s, never a problem. Because again, they had active duty crews and reserve crews that were flying the airplanes and they were uh, 3.5 to one aircraft, 3.5 crews to one aircraft. So they were never, ever even close to the line. The, the rainbow of having active duty Air National Guard and reserve crews flying in the same units was fantastic because you have to remember, a lot of these Air National Guard and reserve air crew members that came over were mostly airline pilots and had a lot of experience. Not only experience in the KC-135, but flying experience being in the airlines. It really helped to have some of these airline KC-135 Guard and Reserve folks flying the active duty airplanes and mingled in the squadrons because they helped solve a lot of the problems at the unit level because of their experience, which was fantastic. It was great. I'm very concerned about the capability gap that we have right now at this time period for the tanker world and the tanker community. We are sending KC-135s 
and KC-10s, all of the KC-10s, all 59 of the KC-10s, to the Boneyard. In the KC-10s case, they still have a lot of flying time left on them. KC-135s, you know, they've got a lot of time on them already. They've been flown for decades. If we ever went to war in the Indo-Pacific theater, we have a big tanker capability gap right now. A huge capability gap. And it really concerns me. The vastness of the ocean in the Pacific, particularly South China Sea, and across the Indian Ocean is incredible. And the amount of gas that you need to keep fighters and bombers and intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance airplanes up across that vastness is huge. And I don't think, that my opinion only, I do not think that we have the tanker capability that we will need in order to be able to fight a war in the South China Sea or in the South Pacific, particularly if China goes after Taiwan or we have a fight in the South China Sea over the Spratly Islands. They just recently did an exercise in the Indo-Pacific Command Theater. Someone I know is the Indo-Pacific Commander right now, Chris Aquilino, Lung. He was the Ripper Squadron Commander in CAG-7, when I got to go on board the John F. Kennedy right after uh, Anaconda. And I know that General Minahan, the AMC commander right now, is also concerned. They had this big exercise, and I'm hearing from a lot of people that there is a big tanker issue right now because we don't have enough of them. I've also found out from some of my industry bros that they are going to cut up and destroy or scrap the KC-10s when they get to the boneyard. To me, this is crazy. You should sell those to some of these commercial air refueling companies, Omega, uh, Madeira. Let them buy these things. But no, somewhere along the line in the Defense Department, or some political group or some lawyer group has said we are not going to keep the KC-10s in the active duty or reserve component. We're going to send them to the boneyard. And when they get there, they're going to scrap them. I don't understand this because, again, I believe we have a huge capability gap for tankers and air refueling that no one is talking about. I do not know why Chief of Staff of the Air Force, CQ Brown, thought that getting rid of tankers was a good idea. I wasn't in those meetings. I didn't hear all the facts that were being passed back and forth. As a tanker planner and executor, someone that has done the war in Afghanistan and Iraq, I think that it is madness to get rid of these things, particularly with the KC-46 still having problems with its remote vision system and some quality assurance uh, problems that they've had on the line. You have KC-135s and KC-10s going to the boneyard and they are not expeditiously being replaced by the KC-46s that should be coming sooner, faster, whatever you want to call it, which is, I think, creating this capability gap. A lot of my buddies in industry that fly for some of these commercial units are saying they should be allowed to buy these KC-10s so that they can help fill this gap. And even if they can't bring them into the theater because of insurance and problems for having commercial KC-10s near some combat area, at least they could be part of the air bridge that gets them to the theater, gets the fighters, the bombers, the ISR aircraft, the global strike aircraft from the states that go over, hit their targets and come back. At least those airplanes are available. But no, what I'm hearing from all of my friends out there that are in the military and in industry is 
there is a tanker capability gap that is not being discussed, is not being uh, talked about in the news. And there was recently an exercise that they did in the Pacific that showed there is an air refueling gap in case we go to war in the Indian Ocean, the South Pacific, or against China in a Taiwan fight. And folks, I do not know why this is happening. Nobody kicks ass without tanker gas. You've heard it over and over and over again. And why this is being allowed to happen, I do not know. But I'm telling you, I have enough people in the military and in industry that are telling me that not only is there a gap, but it's getting wider because of issues they've had with the KC-46 and the retirement of the KC-10s, all of them, all 59 are going to the Boneyard, and some KC-135s, and the KC-10s are going to be scrapped, cut up, just like the B-52s, have their wings taken off, have their engines gone, whatever scrapping means. I'm concerned about that, and you should be concerned about that also. I've told you before, gas is what an air campaign lives on. It is the food of the fighters, the bombers, and the ISR airplanes. And what I'm hearing concerns me that we do not have the air refueling capability that we had even during Operation Iraqi Freedom and the Shock and Awe campaign because more tankers are being put in the boneyard and some of those are being destroyed, being scrapped. Oh, there's one other thing I got to mention at the strategic level. As most of you know, there are different kinds of refueling systems out there. The Air Force uses predominantly the receptacle, boom in the receptacle. The Navy, Marine Corps, and most international countries use probe and drogue. The Navy does not like our iron basket that we put on the back of the boom. What they call it the Iron Maiden or the Wrecking Ball because they've had some really bad experiences with it, slapping canopies and breaking them. The KC-10 community had what's called warp pods, wingtip air refueling pods. I put all of the airplanes that were at Aldafra had those wingtip air refueling pods and a centerline drogue, which allowed them to really provide support for the three Navy carriers that were in the Northern Arabian Gulf. And the Navy loves the KC-10 Nerf basket. And so whenever we had big, large Navy packages going into Iraq, either from the Northern Arabian Gulf or from coming around the uh, to the Gulf of Agaba, oh, I should mention that too, they got KC-10 Nerf baskets. The KC-135 community was just getting what they called the multi-point refueling pods which had really nice collapsible baskets, really good pods, but they only bought 33 pod sets. We ended up getting 29 of those pod sets in theater and I put them all at Akrotiria. I didn't put them all throughout the AOR because of the maintenance tail. I wanted them all in one location so that if maintenance was needed on any of those pods, they were all in one location. And guess what? We had to do some field maintenance on them. The Navy was getting what we called basket slaps in the run up to the war with these brand new pods. I think we brought the Mippers pods in December of 2002 and we're flying with them. And the Navy was telling us they're getting the big sine wave and they're getting basket slaps. I think this was in January. And if I remember right, Casey Albright, who was the CAG on the Lincoln, called me and said, Sluggo, we got to get these fixed before we go into the big war, man. We can't have this. They're breaking off probes and breaking off doors. And I'm trying to sit there and I'm figuring out what's going on. What's causing this sine wave? Okay, let me explain this real quick. You know when you go out in your front yard and you grab the garden hose and you shake it up and down and it causes that wave in the garden hose when you're trying to like make it extend, get around the corner of something and uh, move the hose? That's the sine wave that when you hit the basket too hard, when you try to plug into the basket at too fast of speed, it's like shaking the garden hose. And that wave goes up to the pod, can't go any farther, and then turns around and comes back with a great amount of force. So much force you can feel it through the whole airplane, I'm told, by all of my Navy buds. And what that does is 
it just jars the you know, the probe and takes it off or takes the door off of the air refueling probe and in some cases separates the basket from the hose. So the hose is just flailing around with gas flying out of it. Or in a even worse condition, the basket comes off and hits the airplane. That's what we mean when we say basket slap. They try and connect at too high an airspeed, causing that sine wave, that wave like you see when you shake your garden hose, it goes up to the pod, has nowhere else to go, comes back down the hose, and hits the airplane, causing the basket to either completely come off or disconnect from the probe and hit the airplane in what we call a basket slap. And yes, they have taken off canopies in some of these situations over Afghanistan. People were telling me, the Navy bubbas were telling me, you can feel it through the whole airplane when that sine wave goes up, hits the pod, comes back and snaps the probe off. You can feel it through the whole plane. It's that dramatic. It's that hard. Well, we're sitting there, we're trying to figure out what in the world is causing this. And we found out what the problem was. The Navy NATOPS air refueling manual says, approach the basket at 10 to 15 knots. The hose take up reel springs were set to five knots. And because they were hitting them with more force, it was causing the take up reels not to take the hose up fast enough, which was causing this sine wave in the hose to go up to the pod, back to the basket and rip things off. As soon as we figured that out, we wrote a letter to all of the air wing commanders and told them, we know what's causing it, slow down. You need more finesse. Only approach the new MIPPERS pods with about five knots of overtake until we can get them fixed. And folks, this is where industry came to help us in such a big way. I can't say enough good things about the company Cobham. Cobham is the manufacturer of the KC-135 multi-point refueling pods. As soon as we found out what the problem was, they sent their field service engineers over to Saudi Arabia and then to Akrotiri and made adjustments on every single pod. I can't say enough good things about Cobham. They came to the plate. They saw, okay, we've got a problem. We've got to go fix it. And they did it. And these field service engineers, some of them came into Saudi Arabia. And then again, all these MIPPERS pods ended up at Akrotiri on Cyprus. And they adjusted them all, did other field service engineering work on them, fixed these things up so they were working perfectly by the time the war started. I always go to the Cobham people when I go to any symposium, if they're there, and shake all their hands and tell them, I got a great story for you guys. You guys did a great, great service to the military, to the Navy, and to the Air Force when you sent those field service engineers into theater and fixed the pods all up. Because once... Those field service engineers made it in there, did all the adjustments on the pods that they needed to. I think we only had like one or two basket slaps after that instead of like two or three a week. And as I mentioned, everyone that had one of these basket problems where that sine wave went up to the pod, came back, they said you could feel it through the whole entire airplane and you just kind of hunkered down and went and waited for it to come either take off your probe or take off the probe door or take off the the drogue. There's a number of Navy airplanes that actually landed with the drogue on the end of the probe because it's made to come off that way. There's a slinky that wraps around the knuckle that holds the the drogue to the uh, hose and when that thing pulls off that whole slinky unwinds and and it causes more problems too these were brand new pods just coming into the fleet we didn't have enough of them we left four at home brought 29 over found out there was a problem and Cobham stepped up to the plate sent field service engineers over to the gulf and fixed every one of them every stinking one of them So let's spend some time talking about operational issues that we had. We knew what our biggest restriction and problem was going to be. Again, from reading the Gulf War Air Power Survey, we knew going into Operation Iraqi Freedom that airspace was going to be probably our biggest limiting factor. We did not have enough airspace to put 16 to 100 to 2,000 airplanes in the air at one time. The Gulf War Air Power Survey said, as far as refueling is concerned, 
the biggest issue that we had that we could not put more tankers in the air was the airspace was saturated. During Desert Storm, there was 122 air refueling areas, whether it was a track or a racetrack. There was 122 of them. And many of these were supporting theater airlift that was coming in and out also. 122 during Desert Storm. During Operation Iraqi Freedom, we only had 20. We only had 20 pieces of airspace that we could refuel airplanes in. And again, it saturated the airspace around Iraq and Saudi Arabia. Gulf War Air Power Survey said the airspace, total airspace that we had was 350,000 square miles of airspace. And now you're packing 1,650 to 2,000 airplanes in basically the Midwest. Think about it that way. We could not bring in more tankers because A, they weren't available, and B, we didn't have the airspace. And in the case of air refueling, we had tankers stacked above tankers. We had low altitude tankers above high altitude tankers. When I say low altitude, I'm talking 18 to 21,000 feet. Uh, 21 to 22 was airspace that they airplanes could flow through. And then from 22,000 feet to 24, we had more air refueling airspace. So you actually had layers, two layers of airspace on top of each other in every piece of of air refueling airspace we built. We took over a th the top third, the northern third of Saudi Arabia when we opened the Fisk military operating area. And it was filled with air refueling areas. We had two out to the west, three south of Baghdad, and two out to the east near Kuwait. We had another one over uh, Kuwait City, actually, is, I think it was out in the ocean. And then to the north, there was uh, three, four. There was four up there. We had the Operation Northern Watch Corridor, which the Turks finally let us use, but they would not let us use any other airspace other than that corridor. And we had three other pieces of airspace at the beginning of the war, Pops, Vayner, and Mac, and then the anchor area down by Suli Manaya which is the one that really made me nervous because it was right up against the Iranian border. In the North War, they would refuel through the corridor or they would refuel in Pops, Mac, Vayner, and Valley. Valley was the Sulaymaniya anchor area. And then down to the south, we had the, the seven anchor areas across the Saudi border, south of Iraq. And then on day four, we opened air refueling areas inside Iraqi airspace. I named them all after female country western singers. The first two we opened were Shania and Reba. We put another one to the east of Reba, directly south of Baghdad, we called Myla. We put one near An Najaf, which we called Patsy. We had one over the deserts out in uh, western Iraq that we called Leanne. That was for the scud hunting. We had another one up by uh, Al Qaim that we called Martina. We had another one just west of Baghdad and south, southwest of Baghdad, about 35, 40 miles, we called Faith, because you had to have faith in the F-15 guys to make sure that none of the Iraqi airplanes came up and shot you down. And that's all we had. That's it. We didn't have room for any more. And fortunately, the war didn't last any longer than it did. But we physically did not have airspace to put all these airplanes in there. And I flew one night. I went and hopped on a sortie on the 1st of April and I just finished watching the Task Force 20 guys rescue Private Jessica Lynch. And I said to myself, I'm going to go fly on an airplane and see what I've created here. See what our team has created and if there's any chaos out there. And of course there was. I hopped on an airplane with G. Love and Monique from the 97th Air Refueling Squadron, which I was a part of, and flew out there, and we had two near misses while we were flying out to Leanne to refuel F-16s that were hunting scuds. An F-15E four-ship went underneath us at 300 feet. Our TCAS system inside the airplane that warns us airplanes are around us out to 40 nautical miles, I could see the three next to the red boxes as they went underneath us, which means they went underneath us at 300 feet. Hopefully they saw us because we had all of our lights on. I'm sure they probably did. They didn't say anything to us. And then uh, on our way back, I think we had another close call with another four ship of something. I can't remember what. 
while we were out in Leanne is when the VF-154 Black Knight F-14 went down. I got to listen to that whole rescue. Bondo, the British AWACS, was controlling all of that. They did a fantastic job. They had them up off the Iraqi floor in about two hours. But again, all of this is packed into this 350,000 square miles. You know, and you think 350,000 square miles, that's a lot. It's really not when you've got 1,600 to 2,000 airplanes, plus helicopters, plus cruise missiles, all these different things that are flying through all these areas. And oh, by the way, we moved the tanker tracks into Iraq and we had the army shooting through Shania and Reba. And so we had to go fix that problem because they were firing multiple launch rocket systems and ATACMs over the tankers through Shania and Reba. But Saddam was using his science project uh, surface to air missiles and guns to shoot at us too. And we had to figure out a way in order to defend the tankers. And this is another lesson I learned about using all of the assets that are available to you. Since we had a high and a low block in each of the Iraqi tracks, Shania, Reba, Mila, Leanne, Martina, Faith, and Patsy, we had to figure out a way to defend the tankers. What we did is as the four ship of fighters would come up, two fighters would stay down hunting around for anything trying to shoot at us while two other airplanes were refueling. And this worked out really well. This is where joint warfare comes into play. I used the special ops guys to help find these things. I went into the special ops liaison element, talked to the colonel there. He actually said to me, oh, you mean you've got other things you want us to shoot at? And I said, yeah, any of these surface to air missile or gun systems that are shooting at us, please destroy them. And a matter of fact, there had one special ops soldier that shot a javelin at a French system, ran out in front of it, told all of his buds, take a picture where the missile hits, take a picture where the missile hits. And he turns around and smiles just as the javelin hits the system on a road and blows it to smithereens. So we were able to figure out a way to defend the tankers using soft assets. The A-10s that were on CSAR alert launched and would hang out underneath the tankers also. We called it the pig pen underneath the air refueling tracks because of that. And where Valley was concerned, which was up by Suleimaniya in northern Iraq, My good friend Moose assured me, Sluggo, no harm will come to you. We will defend you guys. And sure enough, he did a great job as well as Cyrus and his wing too. So CAG-8 and CAG-3 did a great job of defending the tankers from anything that was shooting at us in the Iraqi tracks. And believe me, we were really nervous about putting air refueling airspace into Iraq on the fourth night of the war. The CFAC asked us to do it. We found some pretty innovative ways to keep the gunners and SAM uh, folks heads down. Still had a blue on blue issue with the army, but you know, the army, when they saw where the tracks were, just moved all of their systems up above the air refueling areas and it got them closer to Baghdad where they could be even more successful at at firing their multiple launch rocket and ATACMs into time-sensitive targets or supporting the army march up from in front of the air refueling areas. Now, of course, we had to deconflict with them, and we did that, and we had to make a few changes to the special instructions, but it all worked out. Remember, use all of the assets that are available to you to fight the fight. Our third class was going through the Tanker Weapons School on 9-11. Fortunately for us, we had a good group of graduates by that time that we could spread out and help solve all these problems. 
part of our syllabus focused on how do you create an air refueling system? And it was a big block. How do you create the airspace? How do you do the special instructions? How do you set up the uh, air refueling areas, particularly when they're stacked on top of each other? How do you defend them? All of those different things were being taught at our KC-135 weapons school. When Sun Tzu talks about method and discipline, we had the advantage during the air campaign in Afghanistan and the air campaign in Iraq in 2002 and 2003 of having graduates of the school that were highly trained and were experts on how to do global air refueling. Operation Desert Storm and Allied Force did not have that highly trained group of folks. It was a pickup game. Reading air tasking orders is like reading sheet music. And in the tanker community, we did not have a lot of people that knew how to do that. And those people that did know how to do that went right into planning jobs like me during Desert Storm and during Allied Force. As part of our classes, I taught how the KC-135 and KC-10 integrate with the Navy carrier battle groups in what's called the Joint Air Operations section of our syllabus. That portion of the syllabus was based on the Navy Strike and Air Warfare manual, not Air Force manuals, the Navy employment manual. Every student that had been through the school while I was there, we went down to San Diego and they went on a cruiser or a destroyer, the air operations of float ship called the USS Coronado and spent two days and one night on an aircraft carrier watching aircraft carrier operations. So all of the guys and gals that had been through the KC-135 weapons school were very well trained, not only how to create an air refueling system, but specifically how the Navy did their business because a quarter of our receivers is going to be the Navy. Now, of course, they understood all the Air Force stuff and the Marine Corps too, and to a certain extent, uh, our coalition partners. But we had a whole block of instruction that just focused on the Navy and a whole block of instruction that focused on if you're in an air operations center, here's how you do the planning and the execution. We didn't have very many of us at that time period, but at least we had enough of us that could come over and help run the air campaign. On the initial cadre, Gramps, Mike Taylor, he was one of our chief strategists for tankers. Bart O'Dell, Wayno McCaskill, Shrek, uh, Clayton. We had graduates that were at the CAOC with me helping me build these plants. We did not have that during the first Gulf War Operation Allied Force, and it really made a difference having those people with that expertise creating this air refueling system. It was almost as effective as it was efficient. The only thing that we didn't have, as I mentioned, was airborne reliability tankers that we could plug into if things changed or ground spares if an airplane broke. We just couldn't do it. But because we had this group of highly trained KC-135 air refueling experts on our team, it worked out really well. Now, <laughs> another anecdotal story. We had a guy show up from Fallon. He was a Top Gun aggressor flying F-18s, had been a Top Gun graduate and had been a strike lead graduate of their strike school uh, slats. And he shows up and he goes, hey, I've been assigned to your team. Uh, I'm this person and um, I'm going to work on your team. I said, OK, what do you know about refueling? He goes, nothing. I said, what? He goes, I'm an F-18 guy, Navy. And I go, oh, wait a minute, why are they giving me to you? They said, well, you need help. And I said, well, yeah, but I need people that understand air refueling. And he says to me, so put me where I can learn air refueling the fastest. And I went, oh, no. But I thought, you know what? This is a great leadership opportunity. We're going to put LT on the desk and he's going to learn really fast. Two weeks later, I came down to see him. I said, hey, do you want to move upstairs? He goes, no. So I go, I'm having a great time right here. Leave me right here. I love working this incredible jigsaw puzzle. And I said, then I'm going to put you on nights. I want you to go on Mike Serban's group at night because when the big Navy strike packages come in, you'll be able to understand what kind of gas they need or if there's changes to the, their ATO, how to make those and schmooze those. LT, Lynn Tawney was his name, did an absolutely fantastic job. 
than I was initially scared to have him, but it actually worked out really well. Having these experts is the reason that we were able to pull off the air refueling that we did during Operation Iraqi Freedom in spite of all the shortfalls. The weapons school graduates, I had two S3 Viking guys that were also on my team and LT and all of these experts and the other experts from um, 21st Air Force that worked on the desk, Cardiac Bob, all of these people that work for me were absolutely fantastic. And fortunately for me, General Nick Williams said, name your team. And I was able to name all the people that I wanted and I got all but one of them. And that's because he was busy in the Pacific. They wouldn't let me have him. The tanker air bridge was set up to bring all of the iron, meaning fighters, bombers, ISR airplanes into theater. And that created another issue. Like I said, we didn't have enough tankers. During the first Gulf War, there was about a hundred tankers that were part of the air bridge to bring fighters over, bombers over, the AWACS, the RC-135s, the Joint Stars, as well as the airlift airplanes. Now, the airlift never goes away because obviously you have to get the beans, the butter, the bullets, <laughs> the tents, all those things into theater and we didn't have enough tankers to get them all the way across Saudi Arabia. I had a long conversation with John Van Gielder, who was the colonel running the plan shop at the Tanker Airlift Control Center at Scott Air Force Base. And he told me, he says, Mark, I can only get the airplanes this far. You guys are gonna have to help us get them across Saudi Arabia. I'm like, oh, you know, I'm flying all of these tanker missions for the strike sorties and everything. So what we did is we called it a timeshare at Wedge. There's a town on the Red Sea coast of Saudi Arabia called Wedge that had a uh, navigational aid, an electronic uh, airplane navigation aid. I said, John, if you can at least get the airplanes to Wedge, there is an airway high and low that goes all the way over to Dahran and subsequently to Kuwait that begins at Wedge. We can set up a track that meets over Wedge and then heads east and refuels the airlift airplanes or the KC-10s that are moving stuff. C-5s, C-141s, moving all this stuff. And that's exactly what happened. But again, that took away tanker sorties from refueling all the strike aircraft, the bomber aircraft. But we had to do it this way. The airplanes that were at Prince Sultan were the ones we used to get the airlifters across Saudi Arabia. The airlift airplanes coming across were being refueled in the Mediterranean around Gibraltar. And by the time they got to Wedge, they needed more gas, uh, between 60 and 80,000 pounds typically. So we set up this air refueling track in one of the mid blocks I think it was like 18 to 21,000 feet on this airway that went across Saudi Arabia. As part of the airlift, the KC-10s had to be involved. There's 59 KC-10s. We had 20 of them at Al Dafra, and I think it was six of them up at Burgas, Bulgaria, maybe eight. It, they had to bring all of the fighters over. They could put their cargo, all of their maintenance people on board the KC-10s, and drag them across. I think Zaragoza is where we had the KC-10s in Europe that would pick up the fighters and bring them the rest of the way. Those missions to bring fighters from the U.S. were like 15-hour missions. They were really, really long. But we could only do that with KC-10s. The great thing about KC-10s is they're air refuelable. They can be filled back up. So they would hit a bunch of KC-135s coming across the Atlantic, usually on AR-209 over Nova Scotia, somewhere past... Uh, Iceland, and then in the mouth of the Med, and then again at Wedge to get airplanes across. This timeshare at Wedge was another reason we didn't have enough tankers, because this air bridge had to stay up through the entire shock and awe campaign. And a lot of that was being done by C5, C141s, and KC-10s. During the first Gulf War, same thing happened. Military Airlift Command wanted 20 KC-10s just to stay in the air bridge to move stuff. We had to use KC-10s to 
at Jeddah to go down to Diego Garcia because the bomb dump for the B-52s at Jeddah, they depleted it. And we had to send two KC-10s down to Diego to pick up bombs down there and bring them back to Jeddah. Now, I don't remember anywhere running out of bombs. We didn't fly any KC-10 sorties that had to go pick up bombs. You see what's happening here. We have to get all of the troops over to Kuwait because that's where they're going to march off of with their helicopters, their food. The tanks came in, obviously, by boat, but food, water, uh, tents, all those kinds of things were coming on these airlift missions, which the 135s and the KC-10s were also a part of, which again soaked up more of the tanker assets that we could have used to refuel strike sorties, the shock and awe campaign. But the airspace again restricted us. We just could not put any more airplanes into these air refueling areas. We had them stacked on top of each other. <laughs> and then one night they were actually firing at the tankers through uh, Shania and Reba. And we had to go figure out a way to protect the tankers from getting engaged by ground guns and surface air missiles. There's one other long crossing I want to talk about. I spoke of diplomatic clearances. The Navy wanted to bring the Roosevelt and the Truman home if we could not get them involved in the air campaign. Admiral Shortney Gortney came to me. He was the chief of the nail. Captain Gortney at the time said, we got to get these guys uh, involved. I had a discussion with General Mosley in his office and he says, Slogo, we just got to figure this out. And I said, sir, there's not a lot of options here. And the only option is a long one. He said, Obviously, we can't go through Israel because that's never going to fly. The whole coalition will come apart if Israel's involved. There's no way we can get them through Jordan without coming across uh, Israel. Uh, Syria is completely out of the question. Well, after several attempts at figuring out how we were going to move Roosevelt and Truman strike packages into the theater to drop bombs or to fly DCA missions... We got clearance from the Egyptians to overfly the Sinai. Both carriers beat feet to a box north of Alexandria in the Mediterranean Ocean. (laughs) And for two nights, uh, maybe three nights, the Navy flew the longest strike missions that the Navy had ever flown up to that time period. It was 960 miles to targets in and around Baghdad, Najaf, or to one of the center defensive counter air lanes for the Tomcats and Hornets. Now, we exercised this thing once with just a handful of airplanes, and it worked really well, but the two carrier air wing commanders had two different ways of doing this. On the Roosevelt, the S-3 Vikings loaded the Tomcats and the Hornets to the gills overhead the carrier. They came down the Sinai, around Agaba, in the Gulf of Agaba, into Saudi Arabia, and then they were met in uh, Waibo or Wano out in the west area, refueled, and then into their target area or their DCA lanes. When the war finally started, 20 F-18s, four Tomcats, two EA-6Bs, and I think they even had an E-2 Hawkeye that took off early, flew in the first strike packages. Cyrus Vance and the Truman strike group went to Baghdad, and I think Moose's strike group went to Fallujah with 20 Hornets carrying three 2,000-pound JDAMs, two external gas tanks, the targeting pod, AMRAM missile, two Sidewinders. The Tomcats were carrying, I think, two JDAMs and then had the targeting pod, the lantern targeting pod on the right side and I think a Phoenix and a Sidewinder on the left. And these strike packages required a lot of gas. I think Mongo Koss and Cyrus Vance told me these were like seven hour missions. So it's 960 miles there, 960 miles back. Moose's crew, Moose's wing refueled off the S3s over the top of the carrier. Cyrus's S3s actually took his strike package halfway down the Sinai and then turned around and went back so that everybody was full of the gills when they went around Agaba. And then I had two KC-10s with warp pods waiting for them when they got into uh, Waibo or Wano to top them all off. (laughs) One night, unfortunately, 
Cyrus was coming out and Moose was coming in and uh, they all ended up on the same tankers and that made for some confusion. And then one of the KC-10s broke and couldn't make it. And one of the Brit VC-10 said, hey, I got plenty of gas. I can drag you guys down to Agaba. And that's exactly what that VC-10 did. That Brit VC-10 refueled all those Hornets. And uh, I think they gave the Tomcats a little bit of gas too, down to Agaba so they could make it around the corner and meet up with their S3s as they went back up toward the Truman. I can't say enough good things about the RAF VC-10 guys. They helped out in so many different ways. They were really, really good. Unfortunately, their airplanes <laughs> drank a lot of gas, but uh, they were really good at what they did and helped us out there. So the longest naval strike mission in history was these what is it, 1,860 mile round trip to the carrier going across Saudi Arabia, across the Sinai, back to the carriers. And then finally, the Turks said, okay, you can fly the ONW corridor and the Truman and the Roosevelt beat feet up to uh, an area near Adana. So I think we only flew the Sinai crossings three times, but man, was it tanker intense. And the longest mission some of these guys had ever flown in an airplane to include some of the Afghanistan missions, too. They just, Mongo told me, you know, this was really, really a long ride in a Hornet to go drop three bombs and then come back. But that's what we did. That's what we had to do to get these guys in the fight or those two carriers were going to go home. Okay, let me look here. Okay, that's everything in my notes. I have two five by seven cards here that I wrote strategic on one and operational on the other, and I've covered everything. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, episode and hearing about tanker shortfalls and the problems that we had trying to refuel all of the assets that were participating in this shock and awe campaign. The number one restriction that we had was airspace. We knew that from Desert Storm and reading the Gulf War Air Power Survey. We packed a lot of airplanes into a very small space. And that airspace was moving. It was changing constantly, which meant we had to figure out where we're going to put them, why we're going to put them there. We tried to get them as close to the targets as we could. And we were successful for the most part. Second lesson learned was you go to war with the army you have, not the army you want. We only had a finite number of tankers, 210 tankers, 10 that belonged to the Royal Air Force and 200 that belonged to the United States Air Force. And of course, the Marines had their KC-130s that they were refueling off of. They preferred to do that, which was fine. It kind of relieved some of the pressure on us. KC-135 is a low density, high demand asset. And there was a lot of things going on around the world that soaked up all the tankers. And we still offloaded more gas in 26 days than we had during the 41 day Desert Storm campaign. Again, we had all our models. We didn't have A's, E's and R's like we had during Desert Storm. KC-10's flying a lot of missions too, but that's all we had. That's all we could deal with. My last lesson learned is the KC-135 weapons school and the guys that had been through that, there's gals that have been through it now too. Those experts really proved their worth in gold, their weight in gold, because of their expertise on creating an air refueling system with a limited number of assets and making it as effective and efficient as it was. We could not have done that during the first Gulf War or during Allied Force over Kosovo because we didn't have that school. We were not trained the way we should have been trained. We did not train like we fight, fight like we train because we didn't have this school. Because of the education that those weapon school grads had, it was easier to solve a lot of these problems because we knew what had to be done and it all came from the syllabus. There was not one area of the syllabus that I thought we had to go back and change after the air campaign in Afghanistan or Iraq. Everything we were teaching was just spot on. And that's what education can do for you. We had these highly experienced people that were highly educated. My whole team had incredible experience from doing operations, from doing air refueling operations over Afghanistan. 
And I was able to pick that team and bring them all together and it worked great. But we spent six weeks in hell trying to figure out literally from scratch how we were going to refuel this fight. And fortunately, we had the expertise there to do it. And a lot of the things that we implemented came to being like a week before the war. I'm talking like Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, the week before the opening night of shock and awe. We were still massaging the tanker plan right up until the time we started flying it. And Akrotiri didn't have all of its tankers on the ramp yet until like day three or four of the war. Because again, we had to revamp everything and we had the experts there to do it. The two S3 guys, Finn and Tattoo were their call signs. And then uh, the aggressor, the Top Gun aggressor from Fallon, LT, they were invaluable when it came time to massage stuff for the Navy. Because we got a big complaint from the Navy that they weren't getting enough gas. And when the studies and analysis agency went back and looked, the F-18 Hornet community was getting more gas than all of the airlift, ISR, and the global strike bombers coming from the States and Diego Garcia combined. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. This episode has been brought to you by Tanker Pilot, Lessons from the Cockpit. The book is found on Amazon in all four formats, hardback, softback, Kindle, and Audible. There's 32 pictures that are included in the book. Most of them I took. Some of them are taken by others, like my good friend, Hey Joe. But please go out and buy Tanker Pilot because it goes more in depth in, in the background of other wars like Desert Storm and Allied Force and some contingencies. This episode and previous episodes of the Lessons from the Cockpit podcast can be found on my website at marcusera.com under the podcast pull-down box. All 66 episodes of my podcast are available there for you to download. So please go by and uh, go through some of these other episodes and uh, download them and listen to them. We are fast approaching 20,000 downloads and uh, please help me get over that. Next week on the Lessons from the Cockpit show, we will be interviewing an Iranian F-4 pilot that flew during Iran-Iraq war and has flown the longest strike mission in F-4s at 300 feet behind a 747 tanker that was also at 300 feet going 320 knots. Colonel Fred's going to be with us on the next Lessons from the Cockpit show as he talks about the Iran-Iraq war. Folks, thanks for listening. Thanks for downloading these. And I look forward to talking to you again next week.